All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Life Science Cafe. Uh, my name is Will Fadenhauer. I'm a PhD student in the Organismic and Evolutionary Biology program at UMass Amherst, and I will be the MC for this evening's event. Established in 2011, Life Science Cafe is organized by graduate student researchers at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Each month, we invite different experts to discuss their research. Typically, we host these events in the Amherst community, but we are happy to be able to continue our efforts virtually during this interesting time. We would like to thank our funders, the Organismic and Evolutionary Biology Program, the Graduate Student Senate, the Graduate School at UMass, the National Science Foundation, and our generous UMass Gives donors. Subscribe to our mailing list and stay tuned for information about future cafes. This evening, we're very excited to have Dr. Raul gonzalez Petch with us here to talk about the evolution of coral companions. Dr. gonzalez Petch is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of South Florida. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. gonzalez Petch. Hi, Will. It's a pleasure to be here. Enjoying you guys. Great. So let's get right into it, and, and we'll start off with some questions just about the basics of coral. So what is a coral? Is it a plant? Is it an animal? Or is it something else? Uh, well, corals are a very interesting kind of organisms because, as you say, they are both, right? They are like, there is an animal component and there is like a plant component. Uh, there is not only that, we also have a lot of associated bacteria and viruses. And that, that uh, collective or that consortium forms what we what we know as a coral organism or a, as a coral holobiont, right? Yes. Great. So that, that term that you just mentioned, a holobiont, can you explain that a little bit more and, and where that term came from and what exactly that means for people who haven't heard it before? Right. Uh, holobiont means, it's, it's, it just means uh, a, collective, a collective of different organisms from different species, say, that work together. They, they, they live in a, in a very tight association in a very tight relationship uh, and they they work together to function as a single uh, individual right and that's that's where the term comes from um, um, I think it can be very subjective like you can apply it to different different scales right in this example like we can apply it to a coral and the symbionts and some other micro microbes that live with them but then um, you could also think of a holobiont um, like for instance, of all the all the organisms living in, in a reef ecosystem, for instance, right? Like they're all interacting and they're like harmonically uh, living with each other and functioning as this big unit. And you can go up to the whole uh, planet and you could also think of the whole planet as a holobiont because like all the means, all, all the biogeological processes are interconnected, right? So it's a, it's, there is a bit of a phil philosophical component, uh, but we usually use it for, for um, living beings right okay great so we have a plant and an animal that make up a holobiont or a coral so where does this uh combination of organisms where does the food come from uh what, what you mean exactly where, where, where does it so, come from yeah yeah just for the where, where does the coral get its food so the animal right has to somehow get energy from something so where does that come from right so um as we know corals typically inhabit like um tropical seawater, tropical and shallow seawater. Uh, these waters are very poor in nutrients. Uh, so they need to, to, to find a way to sustain their, their self and to build the, the skeletons and these reef structures that we see based on uh, calcium carb carbonate, right? And the way they manage to do that is by associating with this algae, uh, this microalgae. Um, uh, they are known as Luzantella, or they're also known, they're a part of the family Symbiotiniaceae, so they're the endoflagellates. And what these algae do is that they capture the energy from, from the sunlight and they transform that into organic compounds that then uh, they transfer to the, to the coral. And that's how, how, that's how the coral gets the energy that it needs to grow and build those, those skeletons and the reef, right? So, right, we've heard the term algae a lot and you just mentioned it too. So these algae are living inside the larger animal and that's how the larger what we normally think of as a coral gets its food. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I think we have uh, uh, a diagram, diagram, diagram of that if, if we can show it. Uh, so we have, we have the, the coral colony, right? Uh, a coral is not only a single organism, it's like a, it's, it's, it's a group of organisms that are usually clonal, which means they're like identical 
and of many animals, those are the polyps. There are like different parts of like many parts of, of the of that one organism, the coral, the coral animal, the coral host. And then inside the cells of those uh, tiny polyps, uh, there are these microscopic algae, right? So you typically we have like one, two, two, three uh, um, of these symbionts uh, per per cell, right? Yes. Okay, cool. So the term symbiont. So you, I think I know a symbiotic relationship is is something where both sides are kind of benefiting from one another. So that's what's happening with the with the algae and the polyps. So then, what what exactly do you mean by symbiont? Right. Well, uh, there are different different definitions of symbiosis. Okay. Uh, nowadays, uh, many many people just associate it with a uh, with a mutually beneficial right a beneficial relationship from all the partners involved. Uh, but uh, originally, the 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 term was just um, used to describe any sort of tight relationship or, or tight association between organisms from this different species, usually. Um, so um, right. So the let's say the most the more conspicuous or the larger uh, partner uh, is typically known as the, as the host. The less noticeable or less evident uh, organism is known as a symbiont, the, tiny, the tinier one, right? And that's the one is usually in or on the host. Um, so, right, so, so that's what we know as a symbiont, the, 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 like the less visible component of, of that symbiotic association. Um, but then we also have some other types of relationships that are not beneficial. For instance, we have Parasitism for some people, uh, parasitism is a type of symbiotic relationship, although it's, 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 it's harmful for one of the partners, right? Uh, and then uh, if we go for that definition of symbiosis, then we would consider what we see between the corals and the, and the symbionts, uh, the symbiotic microalgae, um, as a mutualistic relationship. That's what we call it. If, if you want to be really specific about uh, the old well, the two partners or all partners, depending on, on, the, on the system you're addressing, uh, then you want to say, okay, they're mutualistic because they're mutually helping each other, right? To thrive, okay. try, yeah. Great. So we have these algae and these polyps that are working together. Can you have different species of algae working with different species of polyps or is it always kind of the same two species that are working together? Right, so uh, usually, typically for each coral species, we have like a very dominant, um, a very dominant symbiont type, a very dominant symbiont species, one or two species that you typically found inside those colonies, right? Uh, and that would be the most predominant one for that specific coral and at that specific, at a specific location, at a specific reef. Uh, however, we also have some uh, other uh, symbionts or some other microalgae from the same group that occur, that may occur at lower abundances. And those we're not sure if they are actually contributing and also being like uh, playing a role in that uh, mutually benef beneficial re relationship, or if, if they're just like happen to be there uh, transitory, just like uh, by chance, right? Because I don't know, they, they might be in the water or in the closer sediment and they just happen to be there transitory, transitorily. Yeah, so, but, but it's true. There are also current studies uh, trying to investigate uh, because in a same coral colony, uh, you have this kind of three-dimensional structure, right? Some, some corals can be very intricate, uh, so they, they can have these branches uh, popping out in different, in different angles. Uh, so, uh, and also you have like the light component, right? So the top of the coral would be more illuminated, some other parts will be uh, darker. Uh, so there are like micro environments uh, within this colony, and there, there's th th that's an active uh, topic of research, trying to find out if there is a correlation between a uh, certain type of symbiont be, be associated to different parts of the colony. That's, 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 that's something going on right now. We, we still have to figure that out clearly, yes, but it's very possible that they do. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. So where do we find corals generally? You mentioned in kind of shallow waters, but can you give us an idea of kind of the global distribution that we might be looking right. at? Right. Uh, you actually have them wherever you have tropical water, so uh, warm water, right? Uh, shallow water, because you don't you need the light. Uh, the water has to be kind of crystalline. Uh, if there are like runoffs from the shore, like from rivers or so nearby, you're, you're very unlikely to find corals or big reefs uh, in, in those coasts, right? Uh, yeah, and we can find them. Uh, all over, we find them in the Caribbean, we find them in the Indo-Pacific, uh, in the east coast of Africa. Uh, we have the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, of course. Yeah, 
so uh, around the islands in Hawaii. Uh, so we have all these reef systems around the, around the globe in the in this belt, uh, um, in the tropics, right around this belt. Uh, however, we also have some some other species of corals that can build, uh, let's say, smaller reefs, uh, and they can grow in cooler and even deeper waters. And and yeah, so that's something that's something that is being investigated right now because they are also um, they they are considered as potential refuges uh, for 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 the future conditions, right? Because we're seeing this coral crisis right now with climate change. So um, yeah, so there is a, a, a key role of these like colder mesophotic corals. Uh, that's now that's also now now a trendy uh, topic of investigation. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I want to get into the the climate change and this kind of impacts a little bit later. Um, but I am okay. glad that you brought up the different species of corals because when I think about a reef, when or any any reefs of corals that we have, is that usually just one species that's there, or is that made up of a whole bunch of different species of coral? No, it's 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 a whole bunch, right? You have like hundreds to thousands of species per reef. So just that's that's not entirely true. You have, like in the Great Barrier Reef that you have. Um, that's the largest uh, reef system in, in the planet, right? And that's a structure that you can even see from outer space. Uh, there you have up to 600, uh, 600 species of corals. So you have a lot of variation, right? And this is a lot of variation in sizes, colors, shapes. Uh, yes. So, and then if you think about it, most of these corals have a specific type of symbiont. So there are also many different types of symbiont. Uh, if you would take a sample of, of any of these symbionts and put it, put it under the microscope, you will probably see something very similar in all cases, but uh, genetically, uh, intrinsically, they're very, very different. And in in, that also reflects in their ecology. Some are more tolerant to, to heat, some are more tolerant to colder waters, uh, some perform better uh, doing photosynthesis and providing nutrients for the corals. Some others might act as a parasites and they, they might be opportunists that uh, just colonize corals when they are like, um, let's say weak or in a, in a compromising uh, stage. So state. So yeah. So we ha we have a lot of diversity of corals, and it's less evident. But we also have a lot of diversity of the symbionts. Yes. Very cool. And I want to get into symbionts too, because I know that's your your specialty. But just uh, yes. one or two more questions about kind of the bigger. So, yeah. So how do how do coral reproduce? Right. So there are two main mechanisms. Well. First, we have uh, sexual and clonal reproduction and asexual reproduction. Uh, so if we talk about uh, sexual reproduction, reproduction, we have two different ways. So there are a few species that are uh, brooders. So they kind of like, they don't release their gametes. They just like kind of uh, fertilize internally and then they release larvae. These are the fewer. Uh, most of corals uh, actually release the gametes into the seawater and that's where fertilization happens. And that's actually a very cool, it's a very cool event because this is usually uh, synchronized. So these are like mass spawning events, right? And uh, that happen every full moon. I can't remember exactly, but it's different from reef to reef, of course, uh, but it's coordinated and it's at nighttime. So this is, these are actually some spectacular events that you can witness if, you, if you're lucky enough to be diving. And yeah, around cool. that time, yes, it's it's almost like a an upside down rain, right? It's it's it's, it's pretty cool, yeah. Sweet. And then you have the sexual reproduction, where you can have like fragmentation of colonies, like uh, a bigger colony can like break for some reason, let's say waves or storms, and then um, different fragments can grow into larger colonies. Uh, also. Um, there is some budding too, so like a, like a few polyps can just like uh, kind of grow out and, and be released from the maternal colony or paternal colony uh, and establish a new colony and settle and create a new colony, right? Yeah. Very cool, so, so lots of variation there. Yes. And, and so last, before we go to our first Q&A section, um, how old do corals generally love to be? How, how they, what, sorry? How old do corals generally oh. get? You mean evolutionarily, or you mean as in a coral reef? <laughs> well, let's let's start with the coral reef and then go. All right. So, so in a coral reef, so most of the reefs are thousands of years old. Let's say uh, less than ten thousand years old. Like most of them originated after the last is, uh, ice age. Uh, however, you have you can have some uh, reefs that are up to million years, uh, right? Old. So, um, yeah. 
So that's how old the ribs are. Uh, some corals might, most of the corals might not be that that old, uh, but still some of them like are really, really, really old and they're like hundreds to thousands of years. Yeah, we have some uh, some incredible images of these huge massive colonies of corals and those like, what about like maybe three times uh, uh, the high of, of an average human being. And those those corals are pretty, 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 pretty old, of course, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And then on an evolutionary scale, how, how old are these species themselves? Well, corals originated a very long time ago where uh, they belong to Nidarians together with anemones and jellyfish, for instance. Uh, and this group originated like very early in the animal life uh, lifetime. Um, and they, they're like corals are thought to have already originated back in the Cambrian. Uh, however, the stony corals, the ones that we have now building reefs, uh, the hard corals, um, they seem to have diversified as a group uh, in the in the Mesozoan during the Jurassic, right, where, where when dinosaurs were walking around the world, uh, around the globe, and that's when they actually like um, starting to diversify uh, into the groups that we have nowadays. Uh, this actually also matches the diversification and origin of the symbiotic algae. So it, it is thought or it is assumed that um, that the diversification of these two groups actually was related to to the symbiotic relationship they establish right at this at this point. Yes. So that's how let's say how old as as old as dinosaurs let's say. There you go. All right, great. So now we're going to break for our first question and answer segment. So if you're a participant and you've got a question, you can add it to the uh, Q&A section on Zoom. Or if you want to ask your question out loud, you can raise your hand and we'll go ahead and uh, get you unmuted for that. So our first question uh, comes from Brian. He says, has coral and or algae evolved at all since human beings started having a bigger impact on the ocean? Like bacteria, algae have a super fast generation time. So I like to believe that they can evolve to withstand the changing environment. Right. Uh, this is, well, uh, first bacteria, bacteria, yes, evolve very quickly. They have very short generation times. Uh, algae also relatively to human, for instance, or, or, or animals in general have shorter uh, generation times. However, not as quick as, as bacteria, right? So um, uh, to grow, to grow a bacteria culture, you usually have like need one or two days to grow a, a, a culture of, of this microalgae that it's, it takes a few weeks. Uh, so yes, they generate, they evolve, they, they, they reproduce quite quick, quickly, but not as quickly as we, as we would like, unfortunately. Uh, and in the environment, it's hard to assess, right? It's hard to assess um, how, how much these organisms are changing. Um, we have, um, a way to do that is by analyzing the genome, and that's what I do. That's what I analyze. I do the genomes. However, these genomes are very complex and very large, so th that makes them very challenging and costly to analyze, right? However, in the laboratory, there have been experiments where they have managed to evolve uh, this this algae from, let's say, from a non uh, thermal resistance to a therm from a ther th thermal sensitive um, form to a thermal resistant form in, in a matter of what two three years, I think. Yeah, so over, uh, that's about uh, uh, 180, 200 generations maybe. Yeah, so uh, so yes, uh, it is possible for them to adapt, let's say, in a short amount of time. However, how compatible, how, 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 um, how quick can the corals keep up with this that we don't know yet, right? Yeah. Great, and then Hillary asks, how long do individual polyps live? Oh, that's a good question, and that I am afraid I I I I wouldn't be able to to answer that. Uh, however, that that's that's something that um, that's something hard to assess because like um, the tissue is you can picture this. So you, imagine you have a a, a a coral colony. Most of it is actually skeleton, right? So most most of the mass, most of of that body is 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 a skeleton that is growing underneath the tissue, right, where the polyps sit. Uh, so the polyps are constantly pre uh, precipitating that calcium to grow the skeleton. So they're just growing, uh, let's say, superficially, like in the that area covering, covering the colony. 
So in theory, they just like keep on reproducing. So they, let's say, just never die. But of course, you have like uh, maybe some predators eating some or some fish uh, um, eating like or um, chunking on the on the corals, and that might cause them to 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 die. Little the little polyps, but uh, but in theory, like they they just don't, don't they normally just don't die. They just keep on reproducing and maintaining that animal just. Uh, on top of the of that colony, yeah. So that's an interesting question, yeah. All right, great. So now we'll we'll go ahead and move on into our next vignette, which is a little bit more focused on your research and and the uh, symbionts themselves. Um, so let's just start there. Can we? Can you give us like a a quick overview of your research, and and then we'll kind of break it down a little bit and and dig into the details. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of mentioned already before. I mostly work with the symbionts. I analyze their genomes. Uh, that means that I'm mostly, uh, because I'm analyzing DNA sequences pretty much. Uh, uh, this is pretty much that analysis. So my work is mostly computational. So unlike many other um, coral researchers that you might think, like uh, that go to the water and you know, like uh, go out and, and, be, and are monitoring uh, corals and their changes all the time in the field, I'm mostly sitting behind a computer analyzing data. Uh, and you might think that my that it, that that's that's boring, but I like it. <laughs> I enjoy it because there is a lot of interesting information we can we can get from analyzing this data, right? Um, and it's kind of different from from what others out in the field might do. And yeah, so that's what I do. Um, I, I'm principally uh, principally interested in in knowing how this uh, algae evolved. Uh, first, how the transition from being free living to symbiotic. Uh, as I mentioned, they belong to a, a larger group of microalgae that are dinoflagellates. They, they are mostly free living. Um, they, there are even some uh, some dinoflagellates that, um, if if you can, so you can relate more with that with them. Um, there are like these uh, red ties forming dinoflagellates, right? So uh, they are toxic and they can have like an economic impact on fisheries and so on. But these algae that I these algae that I studied, they, these are symbiotic, so these are these ones are good. Um, and I pretty much, yeah, I'm interested in see how they associated with, with the corals uh, by analyzing the, their DNA. I'm also interested in seeing how the actual the symbiotic lifestyle, uh, how that impacts in their evolution and more specifically how that changes their genomes over time. And finally, also because um, in the genome you have encoded all the genetic information, right, of the organisms. Uh, I'm also interested in uh, identifying uh, like the genetic or molecular basis of of um, of their ecology, say resistance to to thermal tolerance or this kind of stuff, right? Adaptation to to specific things, and that's something that we can also look up in their genomes. So that's that's mostly this is mostly how my research I can describe uh, what I do for my research. Yeah. Okay, great. So you mentioned the word genome a bunch of times, and so for yes. people that don't regularly work with genetics or genomes, can you? Briefly explain what that is, and I think yeah, Julia's got your your slides here to help with this explanation. Yes, exactly. Oh uh, yeah, perfect. Thank you, thank you, Julia. Uh, so here, yeah, so the genome is basically is the totality of the genetic information of an of an organism, right? Uh, and this information is actually encoded in their DNA. So here we have a diagram of a eukaryotic cell. A eukaryotic cell is that cell that has uh, its genetic information delimited by a membrane in the nucleus, right? There we have the chromatin, the, the DNA that is compacted in the chromosomes. And that, uh, that's the, uh, I, don't see, I don't think you can see my cursor, right? <laughs> I'm just using my cursor, but uh, yeah, I'm going to the chromosome. And then we have uh, the super cold and super compacted DNA structure. Uh, and that's, um, that's where we have all the information encoded, right? And it pretty much just translated in a sequence of four different letters, four different nucleotides or base pairs, or, or nucleotide bases, sorry. And that's uh, G, C, A, and T, right? One in cytosine, adenine, and thymine. Uh, so pretty much what I do is um, we get, we extract the DNA, right? We send it to sequence. And that's what I, what I retrieve, what I get. I get the sequences of these A, T, C, A, Gs. And I use computational approaches to, to analyze and try to, in, to understand the genetic information encoded in there, right? Whether if it's evolution or, or the genetic basis for certain adaptive trait. Right, so that's 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 kind of what I do. 
Great. So how does the genome for coral or a symbiont compare to the genome of, say, a human? Right. So fundamentally, like if you think of DNA, they're, they're pretty much the same thing for all the organisms on Earth, right? Or almost all of all of the organisms. So like again, uh, like everything reduces goes back to these four nucleotides. However, we have um, different ways in which this this these nucleotides or these letters organize, right, and code that information. Um, also, we have so that can create certain level of complexity. Um, Humans are quite complex, but also like these algae have like very complex features. Actually, instead of four bases, they actually have an extra base uh, that's five prime. Um, that's a um, five. Um, what is it? Uh, hydroxymethyl uracil. So they have an additional one, um, and that usually translates just as thymine. But but still, uh, that's just one of the weird features that these algae have. And also if you, we think of the size, so, so the size of the human genome is about three, three gigabase pairs, which means three billions of these letters, right? Um, three billions. If you think of the size of, um, of a, the genome of a coral, it's an average, let's say uh, 500 megabase pairs, which is like 500 million. So that's like about a six, if I'm doing the math correctly, uh, of the human genome. Uh, but the algae, the algae that I study, these symbionts have in average an, a size of 1.5 gigabase per, so 1.5 billion, and that's equivalent to half of the size of uh, the human genome, right? And if you remember, uh, well, probably you don't remember because you're too young, but <laughs> back in my days, uh, uh, when the, we had the genome, the human genome project going on for, for quite a while, uh, almost uh, about a de decade, right? It took to generate the whole genome sequence of, of the humans. Uh, whereas now, for instance, uh, nowadays with the advancement, advancement of this sequencing and genomic technologies, we can generate uh, this large of genomes within a few years. Like for my PhD, I generated seven of these symbiont genomes. Uh, yeah, within what, three, four years. Uh, so it, that would be equivalent to having like what? Uh, three and a half human genomes, right? In less than half the time. So, so that's that's where the field is going. Uh, we're even going faster and getting better assemblies with the new emerging technologies. And also, uh, prices are going cheaper, which is good. So, it, it's more accessible for many other organisms to 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 be able to implement these technologies. Very cool. So you're using computers to look at these different sequences of DNA to try to better understand how these organisms have evolved over time. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, ancient events from the past and even current events uh, that are happening right now can uh, alter how 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 these sequences change and right, change, right? And that kind of um, stays registered. It it kind of creates a footprint, right? That you can analyze when you're comparing multiple data sets. Uh, and that's 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 it. that's what I that's what I do, looking for the signatures of the evolution and and other traits uh, by analyzing this. So it's, it's pretty much that analysis. Mm -hmm. Great. So have these algae evolved separately from the polyps, and then, or did they um, were they symbiotic originally, or how have these two or have they co-evolved? Did they evolve separately and then come together? What happened there? Yeah, so actually, uh, Julie, if you can, I think I, I put a, a small diagram. This is not true. This is just like a simplification. It's like a tree. Uh, so originally, um, as I mentioned, I know flagellates. Uh, no, that one. Yeah, precisely. Uh, so here I'm just showing a tree, let's say a hypothetical tree where we have different uh, different members of, of this group, Symbiodiniasis, the, is the family of these dinoflagellates. The green lines represent uh, symbiotic, the blue lines represent free living, because uh, in the tree we have uh, intercalated, in, in this kind of genealogy of the family, we have intercalated uh, free living and symbiotic species. So most of them are symbiotic actually, but we also have some free living species uh, in between there, right? So this makes it harder. Like initially we would think, okay, uh, since most of them are symbiotic, it's very likely that uh, the ancestor was symbiotic, uh, but actually we don't know yet. We don't know that, ans that answer for certain because uh, again, we have these this, this free living lineages uh, kind of inserted in, in between there. Um, the dinoflagellates, as I mentioned before, are mostly free living, uh, but at what point was that transition from a free living uh, state to a symbiotic state? That's that's something that that I am pursuing, right? That's kind of uh, 
what I'm focusing in my future in my future research. Yeah. That's okay, so it, mm -hmm. this relationship basically evolved at different points for different species. Uh, yes, but we we don't know if it was only once or if it like you know like if it was one symbiont and one coral ancestral coral that that caused that uh, amazing diversity that we see of symbiotic associations between coral and algae nowadays, or if it was like a repeated series of events, like a, multiple occasions where that happened, right, independently, that led to what we see now. That's, that's, that's something that needs to be addressed. And that's something that we can address using genomics and analyzing DNA, yeah. Very cool. Yes. Okay, so we've talked a, a bit about your research and how you research it. So how does diversity in your field affect the questions that you're asking and how you study these coral and algae? Okay, uh, by diversity, you mean? <laughs> um, how do, you know, differences in, in either the, the organism you're studying or, or who you're studying these things with? What, right. it, well, yeah, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess uh, there are different ways to think of diversity, right? So uh, if you think about, for instance, different fields, uh, I was mentioning that I work as a computer biologist, it's different from the people that work as ecologists, right? There are different types of questions, so they, they can formulate more ideas of how things are going on real time, whereas I'm interested in looking at things that leave a footprint in the DNA, right? Like evolutionary events. Uh, so that's one, one way to answer that. Then you also have, for instance, uh, like where you're doing your research. Uh, if you're doing um, uh, your research in a, a developed nation, of course, you have access to these cutting edge technologies uh, where you can generate high quality genome data and you have like the computational resources that you need. Because uh, like for me, I, I come every day and log on onto the supercomputer of the university where I work at. Uh, and that's where I carry out, uh, carry out my analysis, right? Uh, so you need a lot of resources for that. In developing nations, you, you often those don't have these things. So that's, that's a gap that needs to be uh, uh, somehow bridged. Um, uh, so there is not that decoupling, right? between scientists in these nations and, and scientists in more developed nations. Uh, and if we talk about, say, background or, or, uh, or race or more like a diversity, equity um, uh, point of view, um, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm a Mexican uh, gay man, and I, I don't think I'm, I'm openly so, and I evidently so, uh, and I've never had an, any issue in the community, like the, the, coral research, uh, the coral research community is very open to that, uh, as any type of scientific uh, research, uh, having any different type of background or ideas, that, that's always beneficial, right, to, to, to address pro, uh, problems from, from many different perspectives in a more, and in a more comprehensive way. Uh, I think, as I, as I said, the coral uh, research community is very accepting, very welcoming of any sort of uh, backgrounds. Um, if we talk about gender, uh, gender representation, we have a very represented, we have big names that are female researchers, we have big names that are uh, male researchers. So um, I think um, the coral reef community is, is a good place for, for doing research in a diverse environment, right? Um, yeah. So uh, does that answer <laughs> yeah, the question absolutely. somehow? Yes, that's amazing, yeah. <laughs> that's great to hear. Yeah, so uh, this marks the end of our second vignette. So now we'll jump back into uh, some question and answers uh, with the audience. So. Sounds good. So what genetic evidence do you look for in coral symbiosis? So what sequences or proteins that are conserved, traits, selection patterns, changing patterns, what are you looking for there when you're going through these? these all genetics? of the all of them are actually good examples of what I look for. Uh, some other things that I might look for is, for instance, um, let's say, um, like for certain genes, genes you you can look for for selection. That that would be uh, looking for mutations or substitutions that lead to a better adaptive trait, right? Um, that's one way to look at that. You can also look at, instead of selection, you can lo look at function expansion or reduction. So you have gene families of, like families of genes like that originated from the same ancestral sequence. And, and if they're beneficial, then a way to kind of uh, enhance that function is just by, by, by increasing that function in the, like the representation of that function in the genome. So that's another way to assess it. 
Uh, there are some other uh, genomic elements playing a role, like transposable elements. These are elements of the genome that are jumping around and they can have an adaptive component, but they can also have like a, let's say a harmful uh, um, effect on, on the genome or deleterious effect on, on the organism and the fitness of the organism, right? Uh, what else? Uh, we also have conservation of order of genes or, or, or other genomic regions that tells us how much they diver diverge, things like this, yeah. So, so for instance, in the something that I'm currently very interested in is how, as I mentioned before, is how um, symbiosis can affect uh, genome evolution. And we know that uh, for um, recently established or facultative symbionts, uh, intracellular symbionts and parasites, uh, typically, typically this this transition to the intracellular intracellular space uh, causes like a lot of changes in like dynamic changes in the genome like these transposable elements that I mentioned or rearrangements of the structure like scrambling let's say uh, of the genome so that's something I'm interested in I'm very interested in looking at uh, for for these genomes yeah so it's it's, it's there, there are many different things you can look at you can also look at uh, neutral decomposition to assess the mutation biases for instance things like this yeah great does that I, I hope that wasn't too technical I hope that. No, I no, I think it's great. Yeah. Um, are there genes that the symbiotic algae have that free living don't or vice versa? Uh, that was, uh, so I've done some, um, some analysis of those before with, with some of the genome data we have. Unfortunately, um, I didn't have, I generated, as I mentioned, uh, several genomes. I only had one uh, free living species for which I had a decent genome and I couldn't find any big differences in terms of the in terms of the gene content. Uh, so most of the functions that we think to be associated or related to symbiosis um, are actually very conserved in the genomes that I analyze. Uh, so to have a better idea of what might be contributing to to this free living uh, free living lifestyle in the symbiotic, uh, we might need to generate more genome data from other uh, free living species. Right? We have. Like most people are interested in the symbionts, so we have some good representation of symbiotic genomes, but uh, but there's less less genomic data for for free living species, and hopefully that's coming up in the future. And I in a, a couple of years I can give you a better answer. Yeah, but right now as as uh, uh, as of now I I haven't seen any any specific functions related to 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 our free living habit. I've I've seen. Things like related to maybe energy and, and that might be related to uh, more active swimming, things like this, and cell polarization uh, that might give you this. Uh, so the thing is, these algae, when they're symbiotic, they have like uh, this kind of spheric morphotype, this spheric shape, uh, where when they're in the water or outside the hose, they are like more elongated and they, they have this flagella, right? Uh, so that might be something. Uh, I've seen that a little bit, but not too much, a very strong signature of that. Yeah. Great. Well, we're uh, just about at the end of our Q&A session. We do have one more and a few more questions that we'll, we'll save for then. Um, but right now we'll jump into our, our third and final vignette. So to start that off, um, how are algae important for coral health? Right, as we mentioned before, uh, the algae is are the algae are the ones that provide the energy for the corals, right? Uh, again, the water surrounding corals is very poor in nutrients, so they need some other source of of of, of nutrients or energy, and that's what algae provide, right? That's that's the source of it. That, those are the energy factories of, of the corals, and that's what gives them the energy to con to construct to build the, these these amazing structures, the reefs. Um, the breakdown of the symbiosis can have catastrophic uh, effects in the whole reef ecosystems. Uh, actually, the breakdown of the symbiosis, symbiotic relationships is known as coral bleaching. You probably, you've probably heard about that in the news because we've had uh, very severe and very uh, massive bleaching events uh, around the globe, right? With, with increasing temperatures going on uh, every year. Uh, we're seeing this, uh, this, this phenomenon is going worse and worse. So, so that's what happens, right? So the, if the symbiotic uh, relationship breaks down, the symbionts are expelled from the host 
and then we have uh, this exactly. Thanks, Julia. So we have this. We typically see this color reef. Uh, that's that's an effect of having the symbionts. When they lose the symbionts, we see this this kind of deadly white corals, and they're not dead yet. They're still alive, right? They've just lost the symbionts. However, if they don't recover those symbionts, they 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 will die, and that's what happens. So if you if you expose this. Uh, corals to a, a stressful condition, they, they are going to bleach. They're going to lose the symbionts, right? So when you say uh, it, a stressful condition, is that high temperatures? Is that um, does, yeah, pH? Uh, is that ocean acidification? What exactly do you mean by a, a stressful environment? Exactly. So it can be all of these things. It can also be the presence of pathogens like bacteria or so on. Uh, but right now, the, the, main, the main cause of bleaching right now is the temperature from human-driven climate change, right? And that's what causing the, 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 the massive fleeting events that we're seeing is the temperature. And if we have like a short heat wave, let's say a short, elevated, a short period of elevated temperature, uh, then you give time to the corals to recover their symbionts and they can survive. And, and, uh, and yeah, and the, the reef is okay. But if you have repeated and sustained elevated temperatures, there's no chance for the corals to recover. Right, and that's that's the problem. That that's what we're seeing right now. There is like temperatures keep just going on, uh, in 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 the seawater, uh, and we're not letting the the corals recover and and they're dying. So we're losing them, and 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 this relationship and the corals, the coral holobionts, these are the foundation of reefs. Right, it, it is like these colonies, this uh, huge arrangement of shapes and 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 forms what gives all those environments for all those many fish, all those many organisms like uh, uh, octopi, uh, mollusks, crustaceans to live, to live there, right? Like uh, coral reefs host about a quarter of all marine life at some stage of their life. Uh, of, yeah, of, of all the biodiversity uh, in the seawater. And, and pretty much all these species are losing their home. And that's the big, that's the big issue, right? So, yeah, so let's let's talk a little bit more about what's at stake. So, in addition to the the habitats for all of these marine species, what other services are these corals providing that we might lose if these bleached corals end up dying? Right. So, um, from an ecological perspective, we have that, as you mentioned, like the the loss of the biodiversity. But we also have corals. Um, corals, as we mentioned, they form this structure, the reef that uh, functions as a barrier, right? A great barrier that protects the, the coastlines. And this allows, well, this is, uh, this protects us from, from storms and floodings, us as humans, but they all, this also allows establishments of more, of some other ecosystems so, such like mangroves uh, or such, la, such as um, uh, uh, marine prairies like sea, seagrass beds, uh, things like this, right? That also, that also contribute to, to 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 more to host more biodiversity and some other ecosystem services. So that's one thing. They also, as we mentioned, they are how they are home for many marine species, and this represents uh, um, their loss represents the also loss for fisheries. Right, right. A lot of the uh, sea products that we get, um, we're losing, so we won't have access to 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 seafood, for instance, right, to, or to fish. Uh, there is, and there, and this is a big issue because, uh, well, here in the U.S., maybe we don't depend, we don't rely entirely on that. But there are like whole nations, whole, for instance, island nations that re rely on that. They, they, they get directly their food from, like, their daily food from, from the reef, uh, and also they depend on, on the tourism, right, that comes and visits the reef. And those nations, that's the reef is their whole economy, uh, even for a, a country as big as Australia. Uh, the, the the estimated cost of of losing the Great Barrier Reef was estimated to be in in the scale of billions of years per per year, right? Um, so it's 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 a it's a real threat, not not only for for the ecosystem but also for us directly. Um, yeah, we're also like a lot of um, of pharmaceuticals. Uh, there is an active line of research of. Uh, uh, of finding or identifying, searching for pharmaceuticals that come from organisms that live in this habitat. So that's another thing that we're that that is, we're losing, right? We're losing maybe like a cure for diverse types of cancers, things like that. Um, so yeah, this is this is 
this is some of the things that uh, coral reefs do for us. So we're looking at ecological, uh, human health and safety, uh, economic impacts from these. So I guess the big question is, how concerned should we be and how much time do we have to do something about this? Uh, how much time we have, I don't know. <laughs> we have a very short time, I guess. I mean, uh, the rifts are in uh, a severe decline, right? Uh, if we do nothing, if things remain as they are, uh, they're just gonna keep on decline and we're gonna lose pretty much all species or let's say what, I, I, I couldn't tell, give you uh, a right amount, but let's say 90% of the species right away. Some species might be, be, able, might be able to cope with high temperatures. Some species uh, actually are starting to, we're starting to see some kind of migration patterns to higher latitudes or colder waters. Um, yeah, so uh, probably the reefs, uh, most of the re of the reefs are gonna disappear, but like, or well, they're mostly gonna change of how they look like right now. So the, that huge diversity that we see, that's that we're gonna lose that, right? And uh, that that crazy complexity. Um, and what's our time? I don't know. In twenty years, thirty years, we're gonna we're gonna see these changes if we don't if you don't if we don't. Uh, take severe measurement, like drastic measurements, right? In reducing our carbon emissions to the atmosphere, uh, mostly. Um, yes, what was, sorry, I, there was another thing that you asked that I, I just forgot. <laughs> no, that was, that was the two big yes. pieces there. But um, so for people like me who, who live near Amherst, which is not particularly near uh, large amounts of coral, what can I do and what can people like me do to help stop these issues? Right. Well, anything that is related to, to your, uh, carbon footprint, right? Like just uh, reducing um, uh, the usage of energy, right? Reducing your the use of, usage of energy, reducing the waste you produce, because also we have local impacts of, of pollution and uh, habitat destruction. So you can also have uh, a role in this in, in go voting for people that actually are concerned uh, for reducing carbon emissions, for instance. Uh, that's an indirect way to help, but that's very important to have a politic, uh, uh, to be active politically, right? To 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 to, to elect select elect people that are concerned for these issues, for these environmental issues. Um, yeah, so uh, those are some of the things you can have a, a healthier, greener lifestyle, uh, reduce uh, the consumption of red meats, for instance. Things like that are things that that we can do to help. Uh, if you live close to a reef, uh, there are many, many campaigns that are, uh, that are um, being uh, conducted like locally or globally. And you can find out there is plenty of information on the internet and you can, you can, you can join some of these initiatives to, to help and fight uh, and pro to protect uh, coral reefs, right? So well, but the I most important thing is, is reducing, reducing our emissions of, of carbon to the atmosphere. And from the research side, we're also doing uh, trying many different approaches. We're we're um, we're just not waiting uh, uh, passively to for governments and, and corporations to do something about it, right? We're also uh, trying to to come up with 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 different different solutions to to this issue. There are banks of uh, of different genotypes of corals, many different types of corals. We have banks of of many different types of symbionts. There are efforts to try to generate like super corals, or there are efforts to seek for super corals so we can grow them and transplant them in different reefs, right? Or or corals that are more resistant to to increase temperature and, and try to do that. We're trying to modify uh, these corals genetically also. Uh, so there is a lot of different 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 approaches that are being tried, and, and some of them might sound a bit drastic, uh, but it's really like as you mentioned, we're running out of time, so it's 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 kind of the time to. To, to start of thinking of like very, very um, drastic and maybe a little bit crazy solutions. Yeah. I think that's a, a good place to end that even though there's a lot at stake okay. and we're running out of time that we're far from powerless in this situation. And we've got a lot of people that are working on solutions and there's a lot that we can do yes. as well. Um, so that'll wrap up our, our third vignette and then we'll go back into a few more questions from the audience to, to close things out. Sounds good. So uh, what about corals in the fossil record? What can you learn from that? And can you get genetic information from these fossil records? Right. Uh, 
Yes, we have. We can learn a lot of things. This uh, this fossil records actually a combination of genetic analysis and fossil records that allows us, for instance, to to estimate um, divergence times when they originate, originated, when they diversify, things like that. Um, you can even get not from fossils, but even from living cor coral colonies, you can get like cores, right? Uh, so you can like kind of um, uh, take a sample from like a, let's say like a capillar or like a tube sample from across a whole coral colony. And you can see the, gro the growth rings, right? Of how, of how, um, how they grew yearly or annually. And you even can see evidence of like stressful conditions, like say elevated temperature. Um, you can see a register of that. So that's something you can learn from there too. Uh, I'm not aware from uh, efforts of uh, trying to get genetic uh, uh, material or DNA from, from fossil records from corals. Um, that must be very challenging for some reason. Um, it must be because it's really, if you have a, like the skeleton is very easy to, for it to remain in the, uh, in the, in the fossil records, but the tissue that's again in the outside and let's say it's very, it's a very uh, small fraction of what the coral, the coral is, the colony is. So I guess that might be one of the reasons why uh, they're not, not really studies or not at least that I'm aware of uh, out there. Yeah, I don't know if this answers the question. Yeah. Yeah, I think it did. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about um, kind of the differences between these different relationships. So symbiosis and mutualism and, and parasitism. Can, can you dig a little bit more into each one of those and how they're similar and different from one another? Sure. Uh, so again, uh, if, you consider, if you consider symbiosis in a broader context, um, we have like, uh, different types of beneficial or, or harmful relationships from the different par partners interacting in the symbiosis. Uh, so if they, if they all benefit, this is a mutualistic uh, relationship. Um, there are times uh, where uh, some relationships can be uh, harmful for one of the partners, that would be parasitism. Um, and there are even in, in the coral microalgae associations there are descriptions of this. Even some mutualistic species under certain environmental conditions like uh, pathogens or stress, again, any sort of stress, stress um, uh, can cause them to act from being like beneficial to the coral to actually be harmful. There are some records of that. And there are also even some species that have been re reported to be um, not really uh, harmful, but uh, rather like opportunistic, like when the corals bleach or they're like, uh, in a dis they're this, uh, let's say sick, they have a disease that uh, they colonize, they're more prone to colonize uh, those corals that are kind of like uh, weak. Um, so I don't know if this, <laughs> if this is enough or if there's any other things that need to be clarified. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's great. In, in the in the in the symbiotic associations we have between these algae and the corals we have a broad spectrum there's like some some species are very specific to a certain host some of them are like very generalist um the hosts usually are very specific to the type of symbiont they, they host they, they they keep uh and like while most of them are very likely mutualistic we probably have a bunch of them that, are, that might just be there and be being benefiting from the host, but not really having an effect on, on the host. That would be commensalist, that would be commensalism. Um, and probably we have some even parasitic form, but that needs to be like further investigated. Yeah. Great. Well, we are just about at time. So that uh, that'll wrap us up. So thank you, Dr. Gonzalez Petch, so much for enlightening us. And thanks to all of our participants for joining and asking some really great questions. Yeah. Our next event here at Life Science Cafe has yet to be scheduled, but we will be back with more great speakers before too long. So keep an eye on our website, that's oebsciencecafe.org, or follow us on Twitter at LifeSciCafe uh, for more information. So once again, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez Pesh, for joining us. And, thank you. Uh, it's, been, it's been really a pleasure to have you and, and being able to, to talk about, a bit about uh, what we do here. And feel free to contact me. I don't know if um, my contact details are provided somewhere, but 
feel free to ask uh, Will or Julia or any of these amazing guys for, for, my, for my details if you have any questions and if you want to stay in touch. Yeah. Absolutely, we'd be more than happy to keep everyone in touch and, and answer some more questions if there are some. Um, but yeah, that'll do it for us here. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a great evening.